But what's going on everybody? Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and whatever time it is, welcome back to another video with your man, Holic. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another faction overview for the Divided to Para Overhaul Mon for Total War Rome 2. Today, we are checking out the Madewi, otherwise known as the Kingdom of Kush. That's right, we're finally heading on down to Africa and we're going to try and get some African nations, some Arab nations, and uh, we'll be doing a whole mixture of stuff in the upcoming weeks. But today, let's check out the Madewi. Before we do get started though, I will just chuck one friendly little reminder at you guys. The official Immersioholic Discord is now up and running. We've recently just determined what our next major campaign uh, faction will be. So if you are interested in seeing what's coming up, head on over there now. There will be a link in the description. Feel free to use it, come and join in, say good day, and hopefully we can even organize some online battles. In the meantime though, let's check out the Badawi. So, obviously you are part of the African Cultures Group, which basically consists of the Madewi and the Masezali up in uh, far central northern Africa, more towards Carthage. So the Madewi share the following fa uh, two perks along with the Masezali. You have the Agrarian Wisdom perch, perk, which gives plus 10% wealth from all agricultural buildings. Pretty big bonus, and it kind of shows that you're supposed to be basing your economy on agriculture, at least early on, uh, until you can finally get some trade flowing after you take over Egypt and all that. And you also share the Desert Warriors perk with the Mercedes which gives a plus 10% morale for all units during battles in the desert. Very nice buff, and it will help you out massively because you'll initially be fighting in the desert and will only help out your early game even more. However, the Madewi have their own personal buffs and debuffs, and that is the following. First off, we have the Storied Builders buff, which gives a lower cost for industry and religious buildings. Then we also have the Magnates buff, which gives an increased commerce and industry. So I'm guessing that's so I'm guessing that's applied to commerce and industry as a whole, rather than just specifically to building. Um, because it's usually specific to saying how. So that's interesting. I would like to know a little bit more about that. Then we have the Red Sea Rivalry debuff where we have a moderate diplomatic penalty with Hellenic and Arabian cultures, which while it is a little bit of a pain, it honestly doesn't matter too much in my own opinion because you're surrounded by Hellenic and Arabian cultures and so you'll be going to war with them anyway. You have nowhere else to go but through them, so at the, at the end of the day, you're going to be fighting these guys eventually anyway. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk a little bit more about that as we now get into the part one section of this video where we'll check out the campaign overview for the Madawi. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, here we are on the campaign map, checking out the Madawi. Now you can see, yet again, we're back to having a one hitter quitter faction, that is... One faction that starts off with literally only one settlement. You get hit hard and you lose Madewi, then you're out of the game, it's over GG. Um, so you start off with one city, one army which is garrisoned inside of the city actually. You might want to move it out pretty quick if you're going to keep recruiting units. Um, you start off with three units in addition to your general's bodyguard. And then you have one spy down here to the southeast and that is it. You have no dignitaries or governors or um, champions nothing else. You start off pretty bare bones, however, it is worth pointing out that you have the city of Madewi, which is the capital of the Ethiopia uh, province, which is basically like Ethiopia. Uh, and you have the capital city inside of that province. The other two cities inside of it are Aksum to the southeast, which has gold, mind you, and then to the northeast, which is Ptolemais Theron, which is a coastal settlement. Both of these surrounding settlements up here to the north and to the south are owned by one hit quit of factions. However, it is worth pointing out that you do share a culture with them. If we go to the screen here, we'll see that you are considered to be Egyptian or you're part of the Egyptian culture, as are the Axum to your southeast who are Egyptian and the Blemye to the north are also Egyptian. However, you cannot make a confederation with them. I'm not sure why, but you just can't. It's not an option. Uh, you're not considered to be of the same blood, which is actually the first time I've seen a faction with the same culture not able to be uh, joined in confederation. So I wonder if it's something specific for Egypt, because even Greeks have that option. So 
That's very interesting. I wonder what is going on there. Uh, but anyway, that's what's going on. Your diplomacy is very, very bare bones. Like I said, you only have uh, access to two neighbors immediately. Uh, you do have the Himyar to the east who you have diplomacy with. However, they don't like you because they're an Arab faction who are automatically going to be a little bit uh, less keen to have any diplomatic relations with you. And then the Hellenic factions, which are actually to your north, up here, up in Egypt, they also will not like you once you discover them, which you will discover them once you take the cities surrounding you, which should basically be your first 10 turns. You should have both of those cities uh, under your control directly within the first 10 turns, in my opinion. So that covers your pretty bare bones diplomacy. Obviously, because you're in the corner of the map down here way in the south, you have to attack all of your neighbors and start expanding either north, uh, north, northwest into Egypt, or you could go across uh, the sea here and go into Arabia if you so wish. Uh, in my opinion, it's a no brainer. You go up into Egypt and you get one of the most powerful provinces in the game. However, it's up to you and it's up to your playstyle, of course. Uh, then we need to talk about resources though, because like I said, down here you have gold available in Axum. If you go to the east, you actually have trained slaves available. I think if we even go to diplomacy, we can see. Yep, the Himyar here, the, Mam the Mamlakat Himyar, are producing trained slaves. And then there's more resources in Arabia as you go into it, which is very exciting. Uh, up to the northwest, as you start going up into Egypt, or mainly just into the north, uh, you'll see iron around here, I believe. And then you come up here to around Memphis, and you should have grain. Possibly even fish here at this coastal settlement. And then you have Alexandria up here. Jerusalem, Tyros, which is actually really good for resources. Then you have all of Libya to the west as well. So basically, uh, in the direction that you're probably going to expand, which should be the north, you will have insanely good provinces to take over and start getting your economy rolling very early on. So basically, if you can take over Egypt, which that should basically be your goal to do within the first 50 to 60 turns, in my opinion. If you can do that, take over Egypt, you will have lots of money flowing in and your economy should be laughing. You even have that small 10% benefit to agricultural income, which will be massive considering you're probably going to be taking over Egypt and taking over its agricultural industry, which is pretty massive and probably and probably the biggest thing about the province of Egypt itself. So we've talked about trade, diplomacy, and a couple uh, hints and tips already. But there's a couple more things that we need to cover. First off, Medewi, despite it being only one city, actually has some very nice AOR units available. So you, on turn one, for example, you have the Ethiopian Horseman. Very fast, very lightweight, but still good uh, melee cavalry unit. Definitely want to try and use that as much as you can. And as you go up into the higher tiers of your city, you then get access to uh, Blemby's uh, Archers. Not amazing, but it's nice to have that flexibility there. Then you go up to the next level, and then you have four units of AOR units. You know it's an AOR unit when you see this little black flag symbol here. You have African Elephants and Noble Axemen of Axum. Uh, you have Ethiopian, Ethiopian Axemen. Then you have Nubian Archers, which are actually pretty good because they have a very good range of 175, which is pretty solid. And they're also... Uh, oh, no, they're not. It doesn't list it anyway. I thought they were good at stealth, but they don't have it listed. So straight away, you have some pretty nice AOR units available. And you'll only get more as time goes on. Plus, you also have some good mercenaries. You have the Ethiopian Mercenary Spear Band. You have the uh, African Mercenary Elephants available on turn one. Which only takes up 36 manpower, by the way. And then you have Ethiopian Hired Archers, which also have the range of 175. Which means that your archers, if you do recruit them, will be very nice and useful for you to force the enemy to basically attack you whenever you wish. Next point then is, of course, population. Now, the population for the Medewi should be pretty straightforward, in my opinion. Um, they're not in a bad situation at all. Although they're not in an amazing situation because you only have the one city. If you can take multiple cities fairly quickly, then you'll have a larger population to draw on from. In fact, on turn one, we can see Ptolemy's Theron has 20,000 people in it. And then to the south here, Axum has 20,000 as well. So that's not bad at all. Medewi itself has 25,000 available. Um, so while it's not amazing, 
it's definitely not going to be a problem unless you really just throw away your armies and don't pay attention at all to your mercenaries. Um, and I say it's not a problem because you also have pretty good low tier units. Um, for example, this Ethiopian swordsman unit, it's pretty low tier, uh, but it comes from your commoners population, which is 16,000 on turn one. This is turn one leaves, gentlemen, not actually a few turns into the campaign, like how it sometimes is. Uh, and this unit's pretty solid. It's not amazing, but it's very effective, and you can definitely use it to do a lot of work. Uh, you have the Kushite Painted Warriors, which also come from the commoners social class. Not bad at all. Uh, you have uh, Meroitic Spearmen, which are also the same. Your Baggage Trainers are the same. However, your Ethiopian Horsemen come from your Warriors social class. Your Warriors social class is where you basically need to be a little bit more cautious, but not really all that much. And because you're taking over cities that share the same culture as you, Axum, Th uh, Ptolemy's Theron, and up into Egypt, uh, you'll be getting massive population recruitment centers, especially once you take over Egypt. The population there should be doing really, really well, as long as you get a focus on food and population growth in the region, which you should in a province like Egypt anyway. But that's kind of like a guide or a tip for another video entirely. And then the last thing to say about the Madewi is that they do not have any reforms. I usually talk about the reforms in the verdict section of this, of this video, but I thought I'd throw it out there now before we get into the military. This is the first faction I've covered where they actually don't have a reform. Uh, at least not yet at the time of this recording, which is the 1.2.7b patch for DEI might change in the future if you're watching this far off but if any major changes happen to these factions i will uh, cover them in like faction overview updates and i'll post a comment down below with a uh, link to that update video but so far we haven't had to do that at least not yet at the time of recording this but unfortunately that's all i have to say about the campaign situation for the Madewi. it's looking pretty good fairly nestled and safe down here in the far south and uh, all of the other factors I talked about are looking fairly promising for you. You're just going to have to have a fairly aggressive start. If you can do that, then things should be pretty cruisy for you for the rest of the campaign. But anyway, we'll talk about that in the last section of this video. Now let's go to the part two section where we'll talk about the military of the Madewi. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the part two section of this video. Let's talk about the military of the Madewi. Now, once again, before we get into the land units, I will just state that it's not worth checking out the naval units of the Madewi. Unfortunately, they're pretty terrible, and uh, they basically fall into the category of having barbarian-style navies, or a navy where um, they only have a couple different types of units. It's not really worth discussing, and their ships are all low on HP, but anyway... Let's talk about the land units. This is where it all matters, really, for the Madewi. And this is their General's Bodyguard Unit. One out of three that you get to choose. However, this is your only cavalry unit that you get to choose. This is the Meri Meroitic Royal Cavalry. Meroitic Royal Cav. There you go. Nailed it. Uh, you have access to this cav unit and then two swordsman units, I believe. Uh, we'll go over them soon as we get through the rest of the roster. Um, this cavalry unit is very much tailored towards dealing shock damage however because it's so heavily armored and actually has very good attack and defense you can also use it in a melee engagement basically this is like a Germanic uh, high level noble cavalry unit very useful overall uh, it even has a very good speed of 8 considering it's so heavily armored at 31 and just has good all-around stats you can use it to recharge enemy infantry or to charge down enemy cavalry, it's up to you. Super useful unit and very powerful, I think, to be honest. Anyway, now let's move on to your skirmishers. Archers. We have your Ethiopian Noble Archers, the best of the best that it gets for uh, Ma the Madewi Skirmisher Division. They have a missile damage of 18, a range of 185, ammunition of 15, which is pretty standard. Um, their armor is only at 10 though, so despite their massive range and damage, they are still very fragile. However, they do have the stealth abilities such as Stalk and Guerrilla Deployment and Campaign Stealth. These abilities will definitely help you out in your campaigns against the AI and players alike. Definitely not a unit to be underestimated and it's definitely, and it's definitely telling of what is expected of you 
for your army, at least initially while you're using Ethiopian core troops. Anyway, then we jump all the way down to your Meroitic archers. Despite these guys being your bottom tier archers, they're actually not all that bad. They have the same stealth abilities as the uh, last unit we just looked at. However, these guys only have a missile damage of 16 and a range of 175, which is above normal. Uh, but not the longest. They will get beaten by elite archers and they'll just get beaten by mass fires of skirmisher fire anyway because they only have a number of one. So the idea behind these guys is that you're supposed to kind of ambush the enemy army or at least get your troops in a position where they won't be seen until it's time to engage and they don't get uh, devastated by enemy skirmishers. Then we jump up here javelin to the man. Ethiopian skirmishers, a javelin unit. Pretty solid overall, not bad at all, definitely kind of akin to the Mesaisali uh, skirmishers that they get. Um, unfortunately though, despite their massive shields giving a whopping melee defense of 14, 6 of which is from your shield value, which is pretty high, uh, they only have an armor of 8. Melee attack is only at 6. Um, yeah, their melee stats are pretty subpar. The defense is really cool, but I mean, having a low armor rating kind of nullifies that defense a little bit in my opinion so these guys they'll be useful in dealing javelin things but i wouldn't count on them to last long in a melee engagement however once again we see the exact same stealth abilities as the other two skirmisher units so that's your skirmishers in a nutshell at least infantry skirmishers they all have stealth abilities keep that in mind now let's move on to your spearmen and then on to your melee infantry after that here we have your next General's Bodyguard unit, your Meroitic Royal Guard. These guys are very heavy, basically an Ethiopian hoplite. They even have the Phalanx ability as well. Very powerful ability. I would definitely use that if you need to uh, get these guys into combat and holding a position, especially like in a city defense. These guys would be a really useful unit to have for your governor style generals who are going to be sitting inside cities without a large garrison. Uh, massive melee defense of 20. That's a whopper. That's really freaking high. That's not bad at all. Um, in fact, where are they? Can I go on that? No, I can't. That's okay. Uh, yeah, just really impressive melee defense there. Good stats all around. Armor 28, which is really good, but it's not as high as what you might expect for a general sometimes. But it's still pretty solid. Uh, the biggest downfall though is only a speed of 2, which is really low. These guys are going to be very slow on the battlefield. Not very good for uh, leading armies in the field at all. Wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but for a governorship, sure, use them as much as you can. We'll then jump up to your Red Sea Hoplites. These guys are basically a solid mid-tier Hoplite for you. Um, their melee defense is still not bad at 16, but it's a little bit lower than uh, perhaps some high-tier uh, Greek Hoplites. So. You might want to be careful how often you use these guys as a main battle line unit. In my opinion, they're more of the rarity rather than the more common thing that you'll see in the battle, on the battlefield. Although, they do have the Phalanx ability as well, so they're not bad. Their armor is at 25, which is pretty solid for a mid-tier unit. But, it's up to you whether you think your army should be hoplite based or not. I don't think the Medea is suited to that style of warfare. At least not when they're going up against the Greeks, because the Greeks will outmatch you on uh, Phalanx any day of the week, and that's with any Greek faction at all, really. However, now we move up to the next unit, which is basically your one saving grace, potentially. Pikemen, and that is your Meroitic Pikemen. Now, you'll notice immediately that these guys have a pretty small pike compared to normal. That does factor in, and that is going to be an issue for you when you're going up against e Egypt in particular. Because they use a lot of pikes, uh, as well as these Seleucids, they both use pikes quite often. Obviously, they also have the pike phalanx ability, so that's going to be very helpful. Um, but yeah, besides that, they're just a decent mid-tier pike unit. It's an option for you to use pikes, which is nice. Um, but yeah, they're just they're going to get beaten in a head-on clash against Egyptian pikes. I definitely wouldn't use them for that purpose. Instead, try to use these guys against perhaps the Arabs when you go and invade Arabia. They'll be do uh, very good against the Arabian cavalry as long as they don't get skirmished to death. So be careful of that. Then we jump up to your Meroitic Spearmen. These guys are basically levy spearmen like that bloke just yelled out. Um, but they're still fairly useful. Melee defense at 14 which is not bad. 
they can hold for a little while, but they only have an armor of eight, so they're not going to deal a lot of damage. These guys can basically soak up enemy fire for you, or try to hold like an alley street or a small hole in your line while you bring in better units to back them up. Nothing else to say about them. Uh, none of your melee units, I mean spear units, have self abilities, at least not yet. Spearmen ready for orders. We then jump up to the Ethiopian Spearmen, which are basically the same as that last unit, except slightly better in most ways. Um, one of the biggest differences being they have a melee defense of 19 compared to 14 of that Meroite Spearmen. So, so obviously the Ethiopian Spearmen are better in basically every single way. Uh, I pretty much recommend you get these guys whenever you can over the Meroitics. Uh, although they will be a little bit more expensive, especially since they have an armor of 15 compared to 8. But great solid spearman unit for sure. You can use this just to support your cavalry or plug up a uh, hole in a main battle line. It's up to you. Just don't form a main battle line with, uh, with them. And they do have 300 men per unit as, do, uh, as does your other spearman unit that we talked about, the levy unit. As does your pikeman unit as well. I should have mentioned that. That's one thing that these guys have as an advantage. They have 300 men in their pike unit. That's very rare to see. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Actually, it's always 256 men. At least I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but yeah, very interesting. You have a lot of spear options, hoplites, pikes, and some loose spearmen as well. Uh, although you don't have any Thurio spear units, so that's interesting and worth pointing out. Then, though, we jump up to your swordsman, and here we have the Meroitic Medium Swords. These guys can form a beautiful, golden even, quite literally, main battle line for you. These guys are what you'll be wanting to use in the majority of your infantry-based armies, because they're still quite mobile with a good speed of 3, but they're extremely effective with a melee attack of 16, defense of 9, charge bonus of 26, weapon damage of 32, and an armor of 25. These guys have very solid, solid mid-tier stats. These guys will be extremely useful to you. However, you only have 200 men in that unit, although that's not the same for all of your other melee units. So let's keep moving on. So, by the way, look how amazing they look. Isn't that fantastic? Wow. Very nice. But anyway, we then jump way down to your Meroitic Macemen. However, these guys are Macemen. So despite them being pretty kind of levy like with only eight armor 300 men in their very loose disorganized unit they have a high damage they have a weapon damage of 18 plus a melee armor piercing damage of 13 bonus versus infantry of two but they only have a melee attack of seven and a defense of seven so even though they have really good armor penetration um i wouldn't use them much at all to be honest i really would avoid them at all costs try to get your mid-tier swordsman instead uh, all your other Axeman units, which we'll talk about momentarily anyway, so avoid this unit, in my opinion. They're not needed. And then we move up to the Ethiopian Axeman. Now, these we guys are some orders. of the best shock infantry that you get access to, if not the best. Am I right in that? I think I am right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is your elite tier Axeman unit. Uh, and these guys are friggin' fantastic. Super high melee attack of 17, charge bonus of 36. That's higher than some cavalry and on par with most low tier cav, which is insane. Melee armor piercing of 13, uh, combined with a general weapon damage of 25 is astronomical. That's 38 total potential damage done to an enemy unit. Armor of 28, base morale 46. Uh, I'm pretty sure I covered these guys in the top 5 uh, shock infantry video that we did. Well, not top 5, sorry, just top X number that we did for the shock infantry. And I'm pretty sure these guys were counted among being some of the best in the game. Just because of their excellent stats. I won't go over it all again, but... Fantastic unit. Use these guys. They are basically elephants for you on their feet. Use them as much as possible, for sure. But of course, keep in mind they only have a melee defense of 5, so do not let them get stuck in melee for long. Let them charge into the rear of a heavily armored unit, like a Egyptian pikeman unit. And they will do wonders for you and win you battles very quickly. We await your order. Then though we come up to the shielded axemen. And these guys are basically on the brink of being a high tier unit. Despite them being classified as mid tier. Uh, and that's because they just have excellent all around stats. Good melee attack, good defense, good armor. 
but they also have a weapon damage of 20 plus a melee armor piercing damage of 15. So not only do they have good all around stats, but they have fantastic damage potential. And they're shielded and they're armored. So if you still want to have a really good shock infantry unit, but not have it get worn down like this unit does in a long grind out melee fight, use them instead. Uh, they, you can even form a good main battle line with this unit here and in fact I've seen it done in online battles and you'll see that very soon in an online uh, battle where I play against the Madawi. These guys are fantastic. Really recommend you use them. They will decimate enemy infantry as long as they are not charging into the front of pikes. But that goes for any single unit at all really. Then we jump on down to the Ethiopian Swordsman. This is where we're getting back into levy territory. They have 300 men per unit, melee attack of 9, some decent weapon damage and a 7 armor piercing damage on top of that. So they're not useless. They can form a very low tier kind of first main battle line for you. So you might want to use this uh, Swordsman unit in like the first line of your army. And then behind them you bring in your shielded axes who are going to be more heavily armored. And last longer. These guys can deal some damage to the enemy while grinding down their numbers and making them tired. That's basically what it's designed for. Or it's basically also kind of like a levy unit where you can use it to fulfill, I mean, to fill in holes in your main battle line or just give you numbers when you need them. Not terrible, uh, definitely has its use in the army of the Madawi. Then we jump up though to the Ethiopian medium infantry. These guys are very solid, um, and in fact, I'm going to compare them to the medium to swordsmen we had. Yeah, so wow, okay, that's a really massive difference in some of the stats here. So the Ethiopian medium infantry are more tailored towards being axemen and having armor piercing. They have an armor piercing at 14 with a 19 weapon damage. That's very high indeed. Um, but the Meroitic, the Meroitic medium swords have a melee attack of 16 and a total weapon damage of 32, potential weapon damage. Um, whereas these uh, medium infantry, infantry at your command. have only a 9 melee attack and an 11 defense. An armor of 20 as well, so it's lower than the other unit. Um, but basically, you can use this unit as a main battle line unit if you like, or probably more uh, effectively as a flanking unit to come in and flank heavily armored uh, units and get behind the enemy formation excellent unit but unfortunately unlike all of the other melee units we've talked about so far there's no stealth capabilities i would really like to see some stealth get added to these guys but potentially just to kind of make up for them and give you a reason to use these guys over this other spear uh, swordsman unit i mean uh, i mean they have the good armor piercing damage but that weapon uh, i mean that melee attack of 9 versus 16 are like are you kidding me that's an insane difference that's almost twice as much that's really powerful so I would I'd like to see a little bit more done to this unit to make them a bit more viable in my opinion although one of the things about them is that they do have 300 men compared to 200 but in my opinion having massive amounts of men in a unit for a melee unit isn't as beneficial as it might seem especially when you're comparing it to having like 300 men in a skirmisher unit for example um, that's a big difference whereas here not all of your 300 men are going to be able to fight before the unit routes uh, it's more likely they'll come back from routing now so that is useful so there's some pros and cons to be considered we await your then we orders. come down to your Kushite painted warriors um, these guys are interesting they have a very high uh, armor piercing of 16 but the weapon damage is only at 15 but then you compare it with your other stats that you have for it with a melee attack of just 7. Which is really crap. They have 0 armor, only a melee defense of 9. And they have 0 stealth capabilities. What's that? I mean, man, they really should have stealth capabilities. And I thought they did, but apparently they don't. I, I, I can't right click on the unit card to get up the encyclopedia, but... Yeah, these guys need something going for them. I mean, they have 300 men per unit, but who cares when they have zero armor? I would really like to see some stealth get added to these guys. I mean, they have a decent speed of a high 3 and a base morale of 49. But still, just that low melee attack. I would like to see maybe the attack get boosted and the defense dropped by like 1 or 2. Maybe put their melee attack at 12, 13, or maybe even 14. 
You said they're useful, but they're definitely weak still. At least to skirmish your fire and whatnot, so. That's kind of a weird unit. I would love to uh, hear some more info about it in the comments. What do you think about the Kushite Painted Warriors? Give me your opinions, please. But anyway, that's it for your infantry. Very sword focused, or very axe focused, I should say. This is definitely, basically, the main faction in DEI that is focused solely on armor penetration. There's very few units that do not have AP damage. Uh, so that's really interesting and unique. And that's one of the things you need to really keep in mind when you're doing online battles against the Medeo, as you will see in my online video I'll be posting in the next coming weeks. But now, getting to the cavalry, we have one single cavalry! unit of skirmisher cavalry, which is your Ethiopian Light Cavalry. These guys are definitely not amazing. Um, they're kind of similar to the Numidian skirmisher cav in that they're very fast. Um, and they have decent melee attack stats of 11, defensive 8, which isn't terrible. But they only have an armor of 11, uh, ammunition of 9, so they're a decent little skirmisher cav unit for you. You can use them to chase down light infantry like skirmishers very easily too, so I would definitely try and do that with them. But they're going to be very uh, susceptible to missile fire and long melee engagements against other cavalry, so definitely don't want to use these guys as your main melee cav unit instead let's move over to the melee cav category well it's actually more so the shock cav um, because you have dedicated shock cavalry and not really too much else now I do only have two cavalry units here but do keep in mind we have the general's bodyguard the Maroitic royal cav which you can recruit as a unit in its own right um, so we should technically have like three units here uh, but I'll put that general's unit to the side. In the meantime, though, we have the Ethiopian Lancers. And this is your low-tier shock cav unit that you get access to. And that's kind of funny to say because they're really not bad at all. This is a good medium-tier shock cav unit. An armor 23, melee attack at 12, charge bonus at 40, high speed of 8, and a decent melee defense of 9. These guys can be used in melee extended engagements against other mid- to low-tier cavalry. Not high-tier, definitely not high. But mid to low for sure, they'll give them a run for their money. But of course, most importantly, uh, Lancer style cavalry are always going to be best used in recharging the enemy. But then, we upgrade a hell of a lot to the Ethiopian Quilted Cataphracts. Now, these guys have some lower stats in some respects. For example, the first unit, Ethiopian Lancers, has 12 melee attack. This only has 10. But we're also going up to a charge bonus of 48, a weapon damage of 27, although only an armor piercing of 5. By the way, the Ethiopian Lancers apparently have 12 armor piercing damage, so that's actually pretty powerful. You might want to use those guys instead of the Quilter Cataphracts here, if you're going up against factions that have a um, that don't have skirmishers, or at least not as many, because your Cataphracts are going to last longer because they're so heavily armored at 41. That is the massive difference between these two units, the armor. Um, but then the Ethiopian Lancers have the AP damage, but these guys have good general damage, good defensive stats as well. Basically, you can use this unit as a melee cavalry unit or as a shock cavalry unit, and it's very high tier just because of the armor, basically. Melee attack and defense are pretty fine, they're good. But they're not insanely elite, and they'll get beaten by elite uh, Hellenic cavalry, so be careful of that. But uh, they look pretty insane now. It's looking very nice. I love the quilted look. Look at that scars on that dude's face. He's keen. Very awesome looking unit. Um, so, yeah. That is it for your cavalry, unfortunately. Now we move on to your specialist units. First off, we have the single unit of elephants in your core roster. Elephant! Which is the African Elephants, extremely basic, the most basic bottom tier elephant you can get. Um, but a bottom tier elephant is still an amazing unit. Definitely can win you some massive battles and campaigns. However, the Seleucids have better elephants, the Indians have better elephants, and you'll probably end up fighting both of them eventually. Or at least people who can use their units eventually, so... Keep these guys away from the bigger elephants. Use them purely to recharge enemy infantry formations or get involved with cav, but because they have no armor at all, 
these guys will die to cavalry charges as well as skirmish of fire. So that's definitely something to keep in mind when you're going into a battle. These guys can be powerful, but you really got to protect them. Keep them at the rear of your formation until you're ready to use them. Unfortunately, though, that kind of continues for your Baroitic Chariots. These guys are very lightly armored with just an armor 23. And Chariots in general are very susceptible to skirmish of fire. It's one of the biggest reasons I generally don't recommend you use Chariots unless you really can't get anything better, like any better shock cav like cataphracts or Elephants. Both of those types of units would be very useful. Um, but yeah, this Chariot unit... It's very light tier for a chariot in general, like in a chariot category. Despite its decent stats and other things regarding weapon damage and stuff, its health and armor is just quite low, and that makes it quite risky to use. So, you can try and use them in your army, and I'm sure you could do well if you micro it well enough. The main way you're going to want to use this, though, is to charge down only light infantry, such as archers or slingers, but then those skirmishers will be excellent at countering it, so I'm not really sure what the purpose of this unit is besides just rear charging main battle line formations, which you can do with any kind of cavalry unit, you don't need a chariot to do it. Um, and in fact, if these guys get stuck in combat for a while, then they're really going to struggle and um, die quite quickly, but you do have a lot of you have 50 men here in this unit, and that should be 50 chariots in because it's only one man per chariot, so. Very interesting, um, but it's not my cup of tea. I really don't recommend using chariots, so I need to try more. So perhaps I could be converted to the chariot side of things. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for the Medewi. They have a fairly small concentrated roster, but it's not a bad roster. It's very unique in that it's focused heavy on shock and armor piercing which is not something you can say for really any other factions at least not to the degree that these guys are uh, and they have amazing archers so keep that in mind as well but anyway now let's move on to the part three section of this video where we'll talk about the verdict of the Madewi. Alrighty ladies and gentlemen here we are at the end of the video the verdict for the Madewi. now this is basically going to be a reiteration of just a couple points and then I'll give a final uh, difficulty level rating. But the uh, main thing to understand, in my opinion, is that your early game is going to be fairly easy. You're bordering two one-hitter quitter factions. You have more one-hitter quitters in Arabia, if you want to go over there. And then besides that, you need to take on Egypt. It's one of the few instances in DEI where your future is basically predetermined. It's very hard to go around Egypt and ignore them. And basically, you don't want to do that anyway because Egypt is such a powerful province and region economically, uh, agriculturally and population wise it can give you a lot of different things take over Egypt, be nice to the population when you do take it over and you'll be able to recruit massive armies and uh, the province is very large as well so it has a lot of cities that even give you more benefits if you can min-max them appropriately of course but that's the first main point, your early game should be pretty easy Although you'll basically have to fight Egypt, although it should be up to you when you do so. But then the result of taking on Egypt is that the Seleucids will love you for it. So that means you only have a major power in the region, which is the Seleucids, should be pretty friendly towards you. Even though you have that Hellenic disparity in diplomacy, that shouldn't matter too much because you're dealing so much damage to the Egyptians that will love you. Get no aggression, get an alliance with them if you can. I think you'll have a super easy campaign on your hands, but we'll talk more about that shortly. Next point though is to keep in mind when you're going up against Egypt and other Hellenic factions such as the Seleucids or Macedon, Pergamon, etc. Bactria as well, you'll be going up against pikemen. Pikemen are the bane of literally any other infantry, or at least melee infantry unit in existence. Do not let your guys fight them in a head-on collision, there's no need to, especially if you're just playing against the AI. Kite the enemy army out, draw them out of formation, destroy them with your long range archers and skirmishers, rear charge them with elephants and cataphracts, mm -hmm. and then bring in your shock infantry to finish the job off. And then keep in mind mm -hmm. that once again, I need to remind you that this is a very armor piercing focused faction. So you're going to be using a lot of rear charging tactics with your infantry, not just your cavalry. In fact, you can probably just use only very limited cavalry. 
um, and you'll be pretty good at the late game major uh, factions such as Rome, Carthage, Macedon, as long as you avoid those pikes. Um, any faction that really relies on heavy armor, especially Rome, you should really have the perfect tools to dismantle those armies. So it shouldn't be hard at all in the late game either. As long as you take over Egypt and run that province well and the provinces next to it, your whole campaign is looking fairly easy overall. And this kind of gets to the last point, which is basically the only way you can screw up this campaign in my opinion, is that the Arab factions plus all of the Egyptian ones next to you declare war on you all at the same time. Which is possible in DEI, especially in Total War Rome 2 where, where the uh, diplomatic AI can be pretty random. You can get very unlucky and get a bunch of factions declaring war on you at once, however, the Arabs have to cross the ocean to get to you, and then you only have two direct neighbors that you should still be able to take out within the first 10 turns. Take them out, then you will hopefully negate the possibility of being overwhelmed by a bunch of these smaller city-states around you. So, the Arab armies are, will be annoying to fight because they're so cavalry-focused, but your long-range archers and your very fast cavalry will be good counters to that. I think you can bring in pikemen as well to stop them from charging you to death. And the AI will charge into pikes, so that really should make taking on the Arabs fairly easy, even though their armies are going to be very good at taking you on if they're controlled by a player, for example. And if the player avoids getting charged by your very good axemen that you have lots of. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's about it for the verdict of the Medewi. Unfortunately, I don't really have too much to say about the Medewi. They're a really cool faction, very unique. They have a very nice looking roster as well, very nice aesthetic. Uh, I like their position, it's unique. It gives you kind of a chance to establish your own little Kushite uh, dynasty of Egypt, so that's really cool. Could be a lot of fun for roleplay purposes. In online battles, they're very useful and tangible, and I can see them being very competitive and helpful. Um, they're just a really cool, solid all-around faction that they don't really need anything else added to them either, I think. They just need a couple minor adjustments. Uh, for example, this Kushite Painted Warriors seem a little kind of random in my opinion. Uh, they need to be a bit more specialized, but now it brings us to the difficulty rating. Now, I've said a few times that this faction seems like it should be super easy. Um, and to the average DEI player, I think that's true. However, I'm still going to go for just a 3 out of 10. This is a easy faction in my opinion. Instead of going for very easy, which would be a 2 out of 10, I'm just going for a fairly even 3 out of 10 because if you're a fairly casual DEI player, this roster will be very different to you. You won't be used to having so many shock infantry units at your disposal. And while they should be, in theory, pretty easy to use, because you have to take on the pike heavy factions of Egypt and maybe the Seleucids, you can definitely struggle to deal with those Hellenic and heavy armies early on. Um, but yeah, that's for just like the most basic kind of casual DEI play, which is what these faction overviews are tailored for really, because it helps you figure out what faction you want to play and it might help you get an idea on how to play that faction as well. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you guys enjoyed this faction overview. It's a little bit shorter than normal. Um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to post them down below and I'll do my best to answer them as always. And then it brings me to the final point of this whole video though, which is to actually give out our very first credit and thank you to my man HK for becoming our very first member of the channel for committing and joining the channel. So that's super kind of him. If you yourself are interested in becoming a member of the channel, you can click on the join button down below underneath this video. It should be on the bottom right hand side of the video. You click on the join button and then it will have a list of perks and benefits of becoming a member. It's not a massive list and keep in mind I do just do this as a hobby. But if you would like to help support the channel monetarily, which would help me uh, get better equipment and more games to make content on, it would be highly appreciated, but it is never expected. And if you don't uh, become a member, that's completely fine. You won't miss out on any content from the channel. Although if you do become a member, there are a few thank you perks. Uh, that you will definitely get access to so go check that out in case you're interested if not no problem at all but anyway please leave your comments down below on what faction you would like to see next don't forget to join the official Mojoholic discord and thank you all so much for watching i hope you guys enjoyed and i shall see you in the next one